coming up on the Civil Discourse, a panel discussion on academic freedom in the face of an evolving landscape of diversity, equity, and inclusion with experts from throughout the United States. So I will defend the right to be able to talk about those ideas, no matter how, how much I may disagree with them. And I think that is our role as academic freedom, uh, as protectors of academic freedom, that we come to the defense of even ideas that we find reprehensible for the defense of being able Absolutely. to air them and debate them. Hello and welcome to the Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you from my office at Bentley Hall in West Philadelphia. The issue of academic freedom is a complicated and controversial one. Both sides of the political spectrum claim freedom as a value, but define what it means differently. Today, the civil discourse will take the form of a panel discussion addressing this subject. In the following recorded event, a classroom divided, whose academic freedom is at stake, we bring together four individuals whose different viewpoints on this issue are important in thinking about what academic freedom is and what role, if any, the university should play in defining it. Our panelists are Camille Foster, media commentator and civil liberties advocate speaking from California, Valerie Johnson, associate professor of political science and presidential diversity fellow at DePaul University in Chicago, Kenneth Montero, professor of both psychology and ethnic studies at San Francisco State University, and Amna Khalid, associate professor of history at Calton College in Minnesota. The panel is moderated by Oyen Adedoyen, a reporting fellow at the Chronicle of Higher Education located in Washington, DC. This event was held remotely as an installment of the Pannoni Panel Series, sponsored by the Pannoni Honors College of Drexel University. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to moderate this discussion about academic freedom, which we all know and have heard very much more often recently. So very interested in the, in the topics and, and the different types of conversations that we're gonna to have today. Let's just start very simple. We throw around this term academic freedom a lot. To each of you, what does it mean? Before I can frame my mind around this very provocative question, and provocative to me is a good thing. It, it gets the juices flowing. Are we talking about academic freedom as a privilege? or a right, because academic freedom doesn't exist in the Constitution. It's the First Amendment that exists in the Constitution, and academic freedom is a derivative of that right. And it implies that somehow academics, for a reason of our profession, need to be protected, which implies that some people are not afforded the freedom to speak in certain contexts. It also begs the question of, is the academy a free place to begin with from which you can have academic freedom. Well, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. I like, I like the way you framed that, Kenneth, uh, because uh, certainly today we have to ask the question, you know, whether everyone is afforded academic freedom, even in a institutional context. And that's why, of course, we're here today. For me, as a faculty member for 27 years teaching political science, courses on race, academic freedom is the right to teach, to research, to investigate, to discuss issues, you know, in our respective academic fields. I think oftentimes when we talk about academic freedom, we kind of conflate it with free speech. And the two are different in some very fundamental ways. When we think of free speech, for example, we think about, you know, sort of viewpoint neutrality giving equal status to a marketplace of ideas. And therefore, free speech doesn't necessarily encompass or manifest any sense of competence. When I think of 
academic freedom, on the other hand, it doesn't afford equal status between ideas necessarily, but it is based on some sort of disciplinary standard and peer review that is judged you know, by a competent set of peers. And so academic freedom provides protection for speech that manifests some sort of disciplinary competence. I, I think many of the things that Kenneth and Valerie have touched on, I completely concur with. I'd just like to add on, I do believe that academic freedom, I like to think of it as a right that comes with responsibilities. It is the right to talk about controversial topics that are, and, and bring in material that is relevant to speak in your disciplinary area of expertise, um, and even maybe beyond your disciplinary areas of, of expertise, as long as you're, it's, it's relevant to the conversation within the classroom. It's the right to research, but it's also um, a protection of the extramural speech of students and professors. I am very concerned not to think about academic freedom as only the right of professors. I'd like to perhaps add a little bit more, and I, I hope there's broad agreement on this. I think academic freedom is a phrase that demands some context, and it means something very different in the setting of a university versus, say, public K-12 through ed education. Part of the, the foundational principles of a liberal order is this principle of fallibility. Um, and I think academic freedom is is a concept that we all embrace because we appreciate the importance of always being able to challenge any idea that this is a fundamental to kind of the ideals of a free society in a very, very essential sense um, in much the same way that free speech is in the kind of broader societal context. I think that that's a great point, Camille, and, and to everything that everyone has said so far, it's quite fascinating, especially talking about it now because you know, we're in a, in a pretty contentious time, especially on college campuses. And um, something that was brought up a couple of times was the role of faculty and students on campuses. And so I'm curious to delve into that a little bit more from the sources that I've talked to for different stories. There's been this air of concern, especially among professors about students, students with, you know, strong political beliefs or just differences kind of starting to go at each other um, and, and the term academic freedom has been used in that context. So I'm curious to hear from all of you, you know, what is the role of a professor in that case? What is the role of an administrator in that case? And, and what is a student's role when we're talking about academic freedom in, in a particularly contentious time like this one? I think we, we've never been here before. We're in new terrain. And so I think that it is important to, you know, maintain civility so that we can, in fact, come up with different tools to, to meet the challenge of the day. I mean, on one hand, we want to create an inclusive, sympathetic, empathetic, safe environment for students, faculty, and staff, while you know, fostering dialogue and debate on difficult topics, you know, all the while supporting the foundational tenets of freedom of speech and academic ex expression. The subjects that I teach are very controversial. I teach on economic inequality, racial inequality. And so every class has a preface. And that preface is, look, we're going to have a robust discussion. And here are the ground rules. We have to give place for ideas that we may in fact find offensive. So that's my role. I'm teaching my students to understand that there are a diversity of ideas I always say, test the efficacy of your ideas. You know, we don't want to leave any idea unchallenged and, and undiscussed. Valerie, you know, a number of topics that just have me bubbling as both a professor, but also as an administrator in an academic area and in a, an education that now is at least trying to prepare you for a diverse world that has always existed, but now a diverse world where the diversity demands we treat each of these ideas more equitably. That's what's changed. Diversity hasn't changed. There's not new kinds of human beings out there. What's changed is more human intellectual, experiential, aspirational exper uh, experiences are being validated. Faculty also need to be trained 
when we say we're going to have them uh, teach these difficult topics, the math pro professor thinks, oh, I should, I should bring calculus in faster. That's a difficult topic. And he may not understand or she may not understand that there are biases in how we teach mathematics to different people. And that may never have dawned on a mathematician. In fact, he may have been trained that that is impossible. There's certain things that I want to kind of um, veer away from. I, I don't like, personally, don't like the language of safety and comfort. I don't think we're in the business of making our students comfortable. In fact, one of the things I say to my students when they walk into my classroom is that it is my job to make you intellectually uncomfortable uh, because that's what I'm hired to do. If I'm not doing that, in some ways, I'm not doing my job well. When it comes to the kinds of things that Kenneth you have pointed at, I think you're quite right as, as an historian of medicine and historian of science, you know, yes, there is a social dimension to the construction of knowledge, and I don't think we can be blind to that or to the history of that. Yet, I think there is a difference between being aware of that and learning how to communicate the history of a discipline which may have been implicated in subjugating certain people. And throwing out the baby with the bathwater, which I think sometimes is beginning to happen in the conversations that we're having, where we, where, where I do hear, and I'm not saying you're saying this, Kenneth, but I hear people talk about how particular disciplines are white supremacist or are the purview of white male patriarchy or cis het. I, you know, there's a whole kind of list that goes down. And, and that's not a kind of conversation that I think is intellectually challenging or particularly productive because that shuts people down and it really does throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think there is a difference and I think there's something to be said for being more aware, of course I'd say this as a historian, about the history of your own discipline and your own field because it really does open up your eyes to maybe certain blind spots that you may have as a practitioner of that field. Yeah, I, I really love that. And actually, I was probably going to start in a similar place where when I hear words like inclusivity, safety, diversity in the context of education, like my, my antennas start to buzz a little bit. Um, I've grown increasingly concerned both about the demand on the part of sort of institutions to pursue some of those goals and with respect to the demands of students who insist on certain things like safety, um, that we are creating a, a kind of an ideological structure around um, uh, our institutions that you know, we're calling academic freedom, but is actually something very specific. It's about teaching a particular set of values and ideas. And I think it's, it's certainly interesting to explore the, the ways in which a statement like Christopher Columbus discovered America is not in fact true. Um, but so long as one is also interested in having a conversation about the degree to which concepts like indigenous people are deeply flawed. And when our concepts of notions like diversity, for example, are, are stopping at the group level and not acknowledging the broad and really uh, inexhaustible universe of possibilities that exist within any one of these different group identities that we might traffic in regularly, I think that becomes a serious problem. And it, when I say that, I'm not even so much talking about um, like politics, um, but, but a broader sense of ideology and a broader sense in which we're willing to engage with um, serious questions that can be meaningfully provocative and that can challenge what I think has become kind of a dominant ideological framework where most of the conversations that are happening on campuses have to be within the framework of become, being an anti-racist institution or confronting white supremacy um, and at the end of the day, I think it is exceptionally important to acknowledge that these are in fact ideologies and that when academic institutions commit themselves to these things, they become vehicles for a kind of indoctrination. Now, folks may be fine with that. And there may be degrees in which that is fine. You know, at a theological seminary, I expect some of that, but if it is an institution of higher learning, and we have an expectation that people will be able to meaningfully explore complicated ideas and have their perceptions challenged, and we believe in validability, then I think there is a sense in which, while there has been important progress in the direction of making universities places that are less exclusive, um, that are not interested in excluding particular people, um, that much of the way that we talk about things like inclusivity masks what is actually taking place, which is to say 
we are included, people who share our perspectives are included, but that universe of what is defined as our perspective has become increasingly broad in the sense that what you're allowed to believe yourself has become increasingly narrow. And I think that that is very much at odds with the spirit of academic freedom that I think is important in, in the university setting, but also in the K through 12 setting. You know, as a faculty member, I, I, I hear you all. And I think that you all have some wonderful points. I particularly like the, the notion that DEI itself can become ideological an ideological position. You know, that's something that I think that we have to wrestle with. And, but, but that's not quite um, what I'm talking about. When I say safety, I mean literal physical safety, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I am on the professor watch list. Mm. After Milo Yiannopoulos came to our campus, I, had a Breitbart hit piece written on me. And Milo Yiannopoulos tweeted that Breitbart piece out to his 249,000 followers at the time. And so I'm literally talking about safety. I don't, I do not believe in this sort of, we won't talk about this, we won't talk about that. That's not academic freedom. If it is within the realm of some sort of disciplinary standard, we've got to discuss it. But I think it is important to let students know up front, we are going to have a robust debate. I think that's a perfect segue into kind of where we're going next, which is this idea of these buzzwords, right? We've got diversity, inclusion, safety. These, especially following the events that happened in the summer of 2020 and, and the heightening of that, have you know caught the attention of some legislators that are now trying to impose certain views on higher education and so the question then comes you know maybe a professor or an administrator believes one thing but now you've got pressure from the government saying another so what happens in those cases and whose responsibility is it to push back or push forward the institution does not come to us neutral so if other people are bringing in ideologies, I don't say ignore the ideologies and throw them out. I say put them out on the board because it's a tool. It depends on whether you're using it to liberate ourselves and, our, and giving us space for our students to liberate, or we're using it to indoctrinate our students into a way of going. And we don't always know. I find myself having both agreeing with you and fundamentally disagreeing with you on certain Good. things. This is, this, is, this is the fun, right? This is what right, we're here for. I, I think you're quite right to say that neutrality might be a very lofty idea, which mm -hmm. actually doesn't exist in reality. I, I'm on board with that. I think there's a lot of value in self-critique, in self-reflection. The reflexivity is precisely important because it allows you to reflect on how you're bringing diverse viewpoints into the conversation. But it should not be conflated with the, with the identity of the person to the point that the identity becomes the substitute for the diversity of viewpoint. You know, the dominant discourse about diversity and about uh, anti-racism tends to do that. It conflates mm -hmm. that value of that diversity of viewpoint with the sheer identity in its own right. And then it dictates what people of different di identities can and cannot think. I and think in that right. fashion, it is fundamentally essentialist in ex exactly the same way that it is for which it is critiquing colonial discourses, let's say. The purpose of education uh, is, is under attack. The current trend is toward illiberalism, restriction of ideas, what can I, be- And I fundamentally disagree with that. What I believe okay. is that that is a cover story that was always true. Mm -hmm. In other words, there already was an, illib an illiberalism okay. in yeah. education. And now those who are bringing ideas that weren't in the, in the canon are being seen as the excuse when there always was. I think what you're saying may have been true a while ago, but I think that the field has moved on considerably since then for, histo for higher education. You know, there is a difference when we talk about the academy between what students read and how professors deal with it in the classroom, as you know mm. very well yourself. So... An introductory text could, could be whatever it is, but what magic happens in my classroom, I make happen 
I can make my students read Absolutely. it critically. So our role as faculty is to be very precise about the terminology we are using. I think we're living in times when words are being conflated. White supremacy is overarching. It means 120 different things. I think when we're talking in class, when we're talking about specifics, we need to make it highly contextual. When I ask my students to talk to me about this, I'm and they use these buzzwords, they talk about anti-racism, or they talk about CRT, I'm like, what exactly do you mean? And I think the trouble with these buzzwords is precisely that they get weaponized both by the right and by the left. We see mm -hmm. it being weaponized by the left in the time, kinds of what's called as woke culture and cancellations and attacks, which have very little room for forgiveness and uh, flex, you know, and understanding the intention of the individual. And we see it being weaponized by the right, by Republican legislatures that are trying to actively outright ban the teaching of certain concepts and ideas. Now, I'm no great fan of what is termed quote unquote CRT kind of work, but I do not support censorship of it and the banning of ideas. That's not the way to go. So I will defend the right to be able to talk about those ideas, no matter how, how much I may disagree with them. And I think that is our role as academic freedom, as protectors of academic freedom, that we come to the defense of even ideas that we find reprehensible for the defense of being able to air them and debate them. And I go back to what Valerie said over here about testing the efficacy of our own ideas. So I will go down to the mat, you know, and defend the idea of someone who is saying something I fundamentally disagree with, but I want to be able to counter it. I want to be able to sharpen my own thinking. And I want to give my students the ability to be able to listen. They have a right to hear so that they can contest it or agree with it if so, if so inclined, if that is where their intellectual faculties take them. That, to my mind, is the heart of academic freedom. Yeah, and I do think that we, we're facing a moment in which the supporters of academic freedom are making very strange bedfellows. I look at the article that Camille co-wrote in the New York Times. I mean, when we introduced a Senate resolution affirming academic freedom at our campus, I mean, people who I always disagree with and always <laughs> disagree with me. We were together on this. I think that resolution got more co-sponsors than ever before, because whatever the ideological position, however you define white supremacy, you want to be able to grapple with those ideas. But I think on that, we all agree that we are facing a point at which education as the pursuit of knowledge is at, at risk. And I agree with Kenneth, it has always been that way, right? But it's pretty animated by some things that have happened. I mean, a pandemic, George Floyd's murder, the fact that in over 60 nations across the world and on seven continents, there were tremendous protests, you know, um, for, you know, call, crying out for social justice, however you define it. And I think that the right was under attack. And so this is a response, a reaction to that thing. And so I do think that it is important for faculty to be retooled about cultural competencies and to very clearly understand how power dynamics, if ignored, can undermine our ability to retain students. I think it's worth remembering that there are kind of the, the legal structures that will exist on a campus that actually may have some impact or limit the things that you can teach. And then there's sort of the, the, the jury as opposed to the de facto prohibitions on the things that can be explored, the various ways in which students may respond and faculties might respond. And in many environments, um, it seems to me that the, the cultural constraints that exist in certain university environments are perhaps as important for us to be concerned about, um, if not more important than the strictures that are placed on by the university, which in many instances, yes, I, I share the concern. I, for one, am, am someone who thinks a great deal about the way that my children are likely to be racialized in different school systems and the degree to which that's something that is at odds with my personal philosophy and morality and the, the personal philosophy and morality that I hope to be able to impart to my children whether or not they decide to embrace that for themselves. I would say that some of the dominant models of DEI gave me plenty of reason to stop and pause and, and worry because these 
at least in my experience, what I've seen is these kind of measurable outcomes and these kinds of metrics that are being expected are again boiling them down to kinds of bodies, kinds of students into the kind of groups, you know, whether it's racial or ethnic, that I, I would like my students to come to my classroom and not want to see themselves reflected. I'd like to see their ideas reflected. I would like to position it such that they feel that there are ideas there that they can agree with or disagree with. But I would say that in my experience, there are certainly situations where the new kind of DEI dogma, which is dominant, I'm not saying, Valerie, that you're necessarily in, in that. I think you have a very sophisticated understanding of it. But it is silencing viewpoints on campus. And if it is silencing viewpoints on campus, um, I would say that it is getting in the way of knowledge production. Absolutely. If it is silencing views on campus, absolutely. And with that, thank you, everybody, for coming out today. This was lovely. This concludes our panel on academic freedom, and I want to thank you for joining us today for this special episode of the Civil Discourse.